Hey everyone, so today we're going to be going over the dynamics review content for AP Physics 1, and this is for the exam. Um, so yeah, let's just get right into it. So the first topic that you sort of need to know is just to have a feel for free body diagrams, right? So you kind of have to know what all the forces are. So the force of gravity is very common and applies to pretty much every single object. Um, so Fg, or the force of gravity, is equivalent to the mass times the gravitational constant, and it always points points straight down towards the center of Earth. Now, granted, you're on Earth. Um, there's force of friction, which is parallel to the surface and opposes motion. There's force normal, which is the force acting on the object by the surface, and it's going to be acting perpendicularly away from the center of mass of that object. And then there's tension force or applied force. Um, so that's basically where the force is pulling the object by a chain rope um, or anything of... Uh, those means. So here's an example, uh, very simple, it's just a block with a mass of two kilograms it is pulled to the right by five newtons of force at a constant velocity. Then you want to draw the free body diagram. So to draw the free body diagram, obviously you just draw arrows from the center of the mass. Um, it's given that it's pulled to the right by five newtons, so that's what we did. And because it's moving at a constant velocity, that force of friction has to be opposing it in the x direction at five newtons as well. Um, and we'll talk about it later in terms of Newton's second law. And then it's not accelerating in the y direction, and therefore we know that the force normal is equivalent to Fg. All right, let's move on to the Newton's first law. So Newton's first law states that an object at rest remains at rest, and if it's in motion, it will remain in motion at a constant velocity unless uh, it's acted upon by a net external force. So in this example, we can see revisiting that block where it's five newtons of force of tension and then five newtons of force of friction, that object is either going to be at rest or moving at a constant velocity because net force is zero. And you can tell the difference between those, whether it's at rest or moving um, by the type of friction. So it's either static or kinetic friction. And we will talk about that later on uh, over here with this chart. But let's move on to Newton's second law, which is sort of like the inverse of um, Newton's first law, and that's where you do have a net force. So a net force will cause an acceleration in the same direction. So it's basically a equation, right? So we know that net force is equivalent to mass times acceleration. And whenever the net force increases, um, acceleration will also increase at a constant direct uh, relationship uh, granted mass is constant and then as for mass if mass increases and the uh, net force stays the same then acceleration will decrease inversely okay so now let's talk about newton's third law so basically uh, newton's third law states that anytime two objects interact they're going to experience the same force which is equal and opposite um, so the force experienced by one object on the other one uh, is the same uh, except it's opposite um, from the other object to the original one. So here's a little example. So let's say I punch the wall with 10 newtons of force, right? So the force of the wall on my hand is also going to be 10 newtons, except it's going to be acting towards my hand. And so it's going to be acting um, in the left, right? And we define the left as negative, and that's why it's equal and opposite. All right, so let's now talk about friction. So the first thing I want to touch upon is static versus kinetic friction. So we have this chart here, which uh, shows that over the uh, over time, as force is applied, um, the static friction is the first one which pops up, and that is where friction hits a max, right? Because that's the amount of force that it takes to get something moving against friction. But once you do get it moving, now you're gonna have kinetic friction, which is the friction that opposes the object when it's moving. So static friction will always be greater than kinetic friction because it takes more uh, force to get something moving than to continuously uh, have it move after the initial uh, force. So another thing to note is that force of friction is equivalent to mu, which is the coefficient of static friction, but the equation is interchangeable with kinetic friction, and the problem will usually tell you um, which one it is, times force normal. So the coefficient is a property. So it tells us 
how rough the surface is. It ranges from zero to one, with zero being frictionless, and you can only change it by changing the surface. Another thing to note here is that if the object is not accelerating in the y direction, then fn is equivalent to fg, and so that means that if you have greater mass, there's gonna be more force of friction. All right, so components of vectors. So this is where we talked about this in like kinematics, the kinematics review. Um, so after this video, if you haven't seen the kinematics review, I would highly recommend you check that out as well. Um, so this is where, let's say you had a sled, right? And you pulled it at an angle. That force of tension is not gonna like act equally. And so in order to observe the effects of the force, you have to break it apart into its components and observe it in the x and y direction. So you can see here, in order to do that, you would have to know theta, the angle that's pulled at, um, or the angle that the force makes with the horizontal. And then you can just use trig in order to find each of those uh, values. And I have a little example here showing the net force, right? So the net force in the x direction is just that uh, component of Ft in the x direction, plus the force of friction. And the force of friction is negative. That's why it's negative Ff. And in the y direction, it's force normal, acting in the positive because it's going up, and then that force of tension y um, plus fg. And fg is negative because it's acting downwards, which we define as negative. All right, um, I think the next thing I want to go to is actually elevator problems. So the elevator problems are a pretty simple topic, but basically what you need to know is that when you step on a scale, it's reading the normal force. Um, so what this means is when you step on a scale, um, let's say on earth versus on the moon, that's going to be different, right? Your mass is different from your weight. So because of this, let's say you're on an elevator and it's accelerating in a certain direction, then that means according to Newton's second law, there must be an imbalanced force. And so the force in the direction of the acceleration must be greater because there's an imbalanced force, right, to cause that acceleration. So let's say I have this guy here in this elevator, and the elevator is accelerating upwards. So this means that the imbalanced force here would have to be Fn. So Fn has to be greater than Fg. And when I put into the equation, the net force acting the y would be Fn as the positive, and then plus negative Fg. And then I would set this equal to m mass times acceleration, and then you'll find that Fn will indeed be greater than Fg. All right, so the next thing I wanna do before we talk about forces on an incline is systems. So there's no like specific thing for systems, but these are just a couple uh, key takeaways I would definitely note about systems because this is a pretty big topic and the majority of forces problems are probably gonna be observed through a systems lens. So it has to deal with interactions between multiple objects, right? And for AP Physics 1, um, strings and, and pulleys are massless. And a couple of key pointers is you want to observe systems as one object accelerating. So you can sort of like take away the internal forces and then just observe the outside forces to see um, what's affecting the system and then zoom in on that one object. Um, you want to label the forces that are trying to accelerate versus uh, trying to stop the system from accelerating. So that's that looking at it from lens of the system. And you also want to use some of the forces equals MA for the system because um, in most cases when the entire system is moving as a unit, um, the acceleration of the system is equivalent to the acceleration for an object in the system. So once you find the acceleration in the system, you can then use net force equals ma, so Newton's second law, to find the sum of the forces, and then uh, some of the forces for like the object, and then you can just plug it in for some of the forces of the object equals the mass of the object times acceleration in order to find string tensions, uh, other forces acting on the object, etc. So here's a little uh, practice problem. So we have the system here of two blocks and they're connected by a string. So it's accelerating downwards because of that five kilogram mass. And then that two kilogram mass is just on the table. And so when we observe it from a system's perspective, the net force on it is just the force of gravity acting upon that five kilogram mass. 
So the force of gravity will just be 5 mg, right? Mg. So 5 times 9.8 equals 49 newtons. Internal forces of force of tension cancel out. And then the mass of the system would be the total mass. So we have the 2 kilogram and the 5 kilogram. And so we can calculate that the acceleration is 7 meters per second squared. And since it's moving as a unit, that's the acceleration of the system and the objects inside. And so now we can just calculate the force of tension by looking at the first object. So the first object, sum of all the forces, is that force of tension because the force of tension is the only one acting upon it in that direction. There's the force of gravity and force of uh, normal force, but those are equal because it's not accelerating. Um, up and down, that is. So some of the forces equals ma. So the mass of the object is 2 kilograms because we're only looking at it from the lens of observing one object. And then the acceleration, we already know, of the system is 7 meters per second. So for the object, it must also be 7 meters per second squared. 2 times 7 is 14 newtons. And since we know that the only force acting in the x-direction is a force of tension, that force of tension must equal 14 newtons. Now, let's look at forces on an incline. So whenever you have like a block on an incline or just any object, you can break force of gravity into its components where you have to because uh, very similar to where that force of tension was acting on like the sled problems, um, it acts on X and Y differently. So we call those directions FG perpendicular for the Y and FG parallel for the X. I'm going to use trig to, to find the magnitudes, and here's a little proof to see which angle in that right triangle you create is actually theta. So just a couple things to note for the block when it's in like equilibrium is that the sum of all the forces in the x is zero, sum of all the forces in the y is zero, and therefore um, the, the forces acting in those directions are supposed to be equal to each other. So force of friction, that's static, is going to be equal to the fg parallel component, as we can see up here. Um, where the forces are acting in the direction. So uh, Fg is acting in the x, Fg perpendicular is acting in the x, Fn is acting in the y, and Fg perpendicular is acting in the y. Um, so here's a problem solving tip. Mu, the coefficient of static friction or kinetic friction, sort of links the x and y directions. So force of friction over Fn equals mu. So if you know two of the variables, you can just solve for the last one. For force of friction, we know acts in the x, and force of uh, force normal acts in the y. And so that's sort of that link um, whenever you have a problem that's asking for one of those variables. And here's another thing where force of friction kinetic, if it does note that, means that the object is moving at a constant velocity, right? And here's another thing for when the object is not uh, at equilibrium, so when it's accelerating. Um, so here, the problems can vary. So these are just very general guidelines you want to follow and you want to adjust it based on the problem. So usually net force in the y will be zero because it's not going through the block, right? And when it does accelerate, that usually means there's a net force in the x direction. And so usually what that means is if there's not a rope or tension or something, then fg parallel will be greater than uh, force of friction, which is causing that net force and therefore causing acceleration. So Hooke's law, um, is states that the force on the spring is equivalent to the spring constant, which is a constant force, and it's just a measure of how strong the spring is, times the change in length uh, from the equilibrium position. So that is when it's not stretched. Um, something to note here is that when it's osculating, um, if it's the restoring force, it's going to be negative kx instead of just kx. Um, because if you think about it, um, I should draw this out. So if you have, let's say this, and then you have the spring here, and there's a ball attached to the end. So once it reaches its maximum displacement, there needs to be a force which acts uh, in the negative direction here to get that uh, ball to go back and osculate. So essentially, whenever you have objects that are moving in a circle, um, in order for that to happen, you're going to have what is called a centripetal force. Um, so they're going to have a change in direction. They're constantly changing direction, and therefore their velocity is always going to be changing. Um, and that requires a force, right? But just because their velocity is changing doesn't mean that the magnitude of the velocity, which is speed, uh, changes as well. So the speed does not change and instead stays constant.
So what is a centripetal force? So a centripetal force is going to be a net force, right? Because it's derived essentially from Newton's second law. A net force will cause the acceleration. So the centripetal force is the net force that is responsible for keeping an object in a circle. So whenever you have net force, there must be an acceleration, right? So here is an example of that. Uh, we have a ball in uniform circular motion. And basically what you're doing is you're just swinging it on a spring on, on a string uh, vertically, right? And then when it's at this moment, we've captured it. Uh, the net force on it is going to be Fg, the force of gravity pointing straight down towards Earth. And then the force of tension also pointing straight down because uh, the ball is at its apex right now. So we define the center of the circle as positive and away from the center or outside of the circle as negative. So in this case, the net force would be Fg plus Ft. Um, and what you'll find is that your net force uh, will always be the greater value because that is the direction um, in which the acceleration will point. Another thing to note here is that when you're writing out the centripetal force, it is expressed as AC or rather V squared over R. All right? So that is the important thing to note there about uh, notation-wise of equations. And here are a couple guidelines when drawing those diagrams. So for free body diagrams, you're not going to have any new forces. However, there are some slight adjustments and caveats you want to take into consideration. So the net force, like we talked about, will always point towards the center of the circle. The velocity is tangent to the circle. The acceleration is just how quickly the velocity changes. That's AC. There's no force. If it asks you to draw a free body diagram, you're not going to be drawing the velocity or the acceleration on there, obviously, and the speed stays the same. So there is this thing called critical velocity. So critical velocity is basically the minimum or maximum velocity you need to either make it through a loop or to go over a hill or stay on a surface. Um, essentially, this is where you're going to be setting the normal force to zero um, and then solving for, for velocity there. So usually it's going to involve some sort of contact like a car on a hill or a car on a surface or something. Um, so that's just something to know about critical velocity.